I woke up this morning really wanting to read a specific poem. Um, I don't know why it was in my head. Um, I wanted to read it to Kiki, but she's asleep, so I'm going to share it with all of you. It's a poem by Andrew Motion, and it's called Freshwater. Um, all you need to know, it's about the Thames. All you need to know to understand this poem really is that there's a river called the Thames, and it flows through London. But it flows through a lot of England before it gets to London as well. Um, it's through Cambridge and stuff. Uh, and also that about 20 years ago there was an accident on the Thames uh, where a boat called the Marchioness, which had a lot of people on board who were having a party, uh, a boat called the Marchioness sank, got hit by a dredger and it sank and a lot of people were killed. Um, and this poem is in memory of Ruth Padden. This is a long time ago. <clears throat> I'm visiting my brother who is living near Sirencester and he says let's go and see the source of the Thames. It's winter. We leave early before the sun has taken frost off the fields and park in the lane. There's a painful hawthorn hedge with a stile. When we jump down, our boots gibber on the hard ground. Then we're striding, kicking ice dust off the grass to look confident, because really we're not sure if we're allowed to be here. In fact, we're not even sure that this is the right place. A friend of a friend has told us. It's all as vague as that. In the centre of the field, we find more hawthorn, a single bush, and water oozing out of a hole in the ground. I tell my brother I've read about a statue that stands here, or rather lounges here, a naked, shaggy-haired god tilting an urn with one massive hand. Where is he? There's only the empty fields glittering, and a few dowager crows picking among the dock clumps. Where is Father Thames? My brother thinks he has been vandalised and dragged off by the fans of other rivers. They smashed the old man's urn and sprayed his bare chest and legs with the names of rivals. Trent, Severn, Neen, Humber. There's nothing else to do. So I paddle through the shallow water surrounding the spring, treading carefully to keep things in focus, and stoop over the source as though I find it fascinating. It is fascinating. A red-brown, soft-lipped cleft with bright green grass right up to the edge, and the water twisting out like a rope of glass. It pulses and shivers as it comes, then steadies into the pool, then roughens again as it drains into the valley. My brother and I are not twenty yet. We don't know who we are or what we want to be. We stare at the spring and each other, and back at the spring again, saying nothing. A pheasant is making its blatant cock-cock from the wood running along the valley floor. I stamp both feet and disappear in a cloud. One March, there's suddenly a day as warm as May, and my friend uncovers the punt he had bought as a wreck and restored, cleans her, slides her into the Thames near Lechlade, and sets off upriver. Will I go with him? No, I can't. But I'll meet him on the water meadows at the edge of town. I turn out of the market square, past the church, and down the yew tree walk. Shelley visited here once. It's called Shelley's Walk, but he was out of his element. Here everything is earth and water, not fire and air. The ground is sleepy-haired after winter, red berries and rain matted into it. Where the yew tree walk ends, I go blind in the sun for a moment, then it's all right. There's the river beyond the boggy meadows, hidden by reed forests sprouting along its banks. They're dead, the reeds, a shambles of broken, broad, pale brown leaves and snapped bulrush heads, and there's my friend making his slow curve towards me. The hills rise behind him in a gradual wave, so that he seems at the centre of an enormous amphitheatre. He is an emblem of something, somebody acting something. The punt pole shoots up, wagging its beard of light, falls, and as he moves ahead, he leans forward, red-faced and concentrating. He's expert, but it's slow work. As I get closer, I can hear water pattering against the prow of the punt, see him twisting the pole as he plucks it out of the gluey riverbed. I call to him and he stands straight, giving a wobbly wave. We burst into laughter. He looks like a madman, floating slowly backwards now that he has stopped poling. I must look like a madman too, mud-spattered and heavy-footed on the bank, wondering how I'm going to get on board without falling in. As I push open the curtain of leaves to find a way, I see the water for the first time, solid-seeming and mercury-coloured. Not like a familiar thing at all, not looking as though it could take us anywhere we wanted to go. I've lived here for a while, and up to now the river has been for pleasure. This evening, people in diving suits have taken it over. Everyone else has been shushed away into Christchurch Meadow or onto Folly Bridge like me. No one's complaining. The summer evening expands lazily, big purple and gold clouds building over the Cumnor Hills. I have often stood here before. Away to the left you can see Oxford throwing its spires into the air, full of the conceited joy of being itself. Straight ahead the river runs calmly between boathouses before losing patience again, pulling a reed shawl round its ears, snapping off willows and holding their scarified heads under water. Now there's a small rowing boat, a kind of coracle below me, and two policemen with their jackets off. 
The men shield their eyes, peering, and almost rock overboard they're so surprised when bubbles erupt beside them and a diver bobs up, just his head streaming in its black wet suit. There are shouts. See anything? But the diver shrugs and twirls his murky torchlight with an invisible hand. Everyone on the bridge stops talking. We think we are about to be shown the story of the riverbed, its shopping trolleys and broken boat parts, its lolling bottles, its plastic, its dropped keys, its blubbery and bloated corks, but nothing happens. The diver taps his mask and disappears, his fart trail surging raucously for a moment, then subsiding. <clears throat> the crowd in Christchurch Meadow starts to break up. On Folly Bridge, people begin talking again, and as someone steps off the pavement onto the road, a passing grocery van, irritated by the press of people and impatient with whatever brought them together, gives a long, wild parp as it revs away. Now the children are old enough to see what there is to see, we take them to Tower Bridge and explain how the road lifts up, how traitors arrived at Traitor's Gate, how this was a brewery and that was a warehouse, how the river starts many miles inland and changes and grows, changes and grows, until it arrives here, London, where we live, then winds past Canary Wharf, which they've done in school, and out to sea. Afterwards, we lean on the railings outside a cafe. It's autumn. The water is speckled with leaves, and a complicated tangle of junk bumps against the embankment wall, a hank of bright grass, a rotten bulrush stem, a fragment of dark, polished wood. One of the children asks if people drown in the river, and I think of Ruth, who was on the Marchioness. After her death, I met someone who had survived. He had been in the lavatory when the dredger hit, and fumbled his way out along a flooded corridor, his shoes and clothes miraculously slipping off him, so that when he at last burst into the air, he felt that he was a baby again and knew nothing, was unable to help himself, aghast. I touch my wife's arm, and the children gather around us. We are the picture of a family on an outing. I love it. I love the river and the perky tour boats with their banal chat. I love the snub barges. I love the whole dazzling cross-hatchery of traffic and currents, shadows and sun standing still and moving forward. The tangle of junk bumps the wall below me again, and I look down. There is Ruth, swimming back upstream, her red velvet party dress flickering around her heels as she twists through the locks and dreams around the slow curves, slithering on for miles until she has passed the ponderous diver at Folly Bridge and the reed forests at Lechlade accelerating beneath bridges and willow branches, slinking easily among the plastic wrecks and weedy trolleys, speeding and shrinking and silvering, until finally she is sliding uphill over bright green grass and into the small wet mouth of the earth where she vanishes.